Hi friends, welcome to the Concussion Coach Podcast. Just FYI, the topic of this episode is going to veer pretty far from the content that I typically share on this podcast. If you've been listening for a while, you know that I am quite passionate about helping people get quality information about and increase their understanding of concussions and helping people maintain hope throughout their concussion recovery journey. That's what this podcast is usually about. Today's topic, however, is about my experience of being a gestational carrier for my brother and his wife, which has absolutely nothing to do with concussions, though I will say that this experience forced me to apply a lot of the coaching tools and advice that I give to my concussion clients. So if you're here for concussion information, you may want to skip to a different episode, but you may find this interesting either way. If you are here solely because of the topic of this particular episode, welcome. Today's episode has been a long time in coming. To be honest, I am a little surprised that I'm doing this, but I feel like it's something that I should share. Perhaps it will be helpful with my own processing. Perhaps it will be helpful for someone else to hear. Either way, it will hopefully give anyone who noticed the pause in my coaching and podcasting efforts this past summer insight as to the cause for that pause and subsequent slowing down of the frequency of my posts. The experiences I will share here with you today are special, sacred even, to me, and I am only putting them out into the world in this public way because as I was having a conversation with God recently about next steps to take and where to focus my energy and efforts, my mind inadvertently went to doing this podcast episode and I found myself planning it out. I was pretty surprised to find myself thinking along those lines. As you'll see, I've come to learn to trust thoughts and ideas that God puts into my heart and mind, especially the ones that seem to come out of nowhere, but that happen when I'm asking earnest questions. So here we are with me about to share with you my experience of carrying a baby for my brother and sister-in-law. As a quick side note, I think I can also thank my dear friend and mission companion for this to some degree. Early on, she asked if I would share with her how this surrogacy experience came about, and I began writing it down for her, but also for my own record keeping. I never finished writing it or sending it to her, so I'm hoping this will count. Thank you, Evelyn, for giving me extra motivation to consolidate and record my thoughts and feelings on this unique and life-changing experience. Let me start by giving you a brief rundown of the timeline of events, just so you can get a big picture view before I start in on the details. So the initial instigating experience happened in September of 2022. February of 2023 is when my husband, Thane, and I had the conversation with my brother and his wife, Allison, about the possibility of carrying a baby for them. After a lot of research and prayers and testing, things moved forward and the process of embryo creation began in June. They essentially did IVF using Nate and Allison's sperm and eggs and froze the embryos and shipped them from Hawaii, where Nate and Allison live, to Utah, where I live. On August 31st, 2023, they transferred the healthiest embryo into my uterus, and thank heavens, it stuck. We had a mostly uneventful pregnancy, and the sweetest little boy, Ames B. Jordan, was born on May 10th, 2024, a little before his due date. That was just over five months ago as of this telling. (laughs) So that's the summary. If you want to hear more details about the experience and my thoughts and feelings about it, keep on listening. Um, So let me start with giving you a little background about the parties involved. I am the oldest in my family and I have five younger brothers. Nate is my next younger brother and we have been great friends our whole lives. I remember with fondness our hanging out with mutual friends in high school and conversations that lasted well into the night as he would come and chat with me in my room growing up. He is an incredibly wonderful person. He's quick-witted, loyal, kind, full of integrity, and just good to the core. And he found a girl to match his awesomeness. Allison is brilliant, funny, talented, kind, organized, and just so much fun to be with. At the time all of this started, they had two children who were about seven and five years old. Allison had gotten very, very sick with her pregnancies, and short af- shortly after their second child was born, she was diagnosed with thyroid cancer and ended up having her thyroid removed. Thane is the other player in all of this. He is my husband, and he rocked that supportive husband role 100%. <laughs> Um, So back in September of 2022, my four sisters-in-law and I went on a girls trip together. It was so much fun to spend time with these women whom I adore and admire. While we were there, Allison asked me if I was done having kids. I have six children. My youngest was just over two years old at the time and I was 40 years old. I told her confidently that yes, we were done. She followed up with, are you sure? To which I again replied in the affirmative and said that I feel like six is my number and that our family is complete. She then challenged my response again and said, are you pray about it in the temple, sure? She said that she'd never heard of anyone praying about this question in the temple and not feeling like, yes, they should have more kids. 
So for context, in my religion, we believe that temples are a sacred place of peace and learning and where people can receive personal revelation from God. I told her with only the slightest bit of hesitation that I wasn't scared and I would do it. She said, okay, pray about it in the temple and let me know how that goes. <laughs> so um, I think it's also worth noting that she was not fishing for anything. She was genuinely just curious about our family planning. Um, the idea of me being a surrogate for her was not on either of our radars at all. So months passed and I kept forgetting to say that prayer every time I was in the temple. One evening though, Thane and I had gone to the temple and were in what is called the celestial room when I finally remembered Allison's challenge and decided to pray about whether our family was complete or not. After my prayer and some pondering, I felt peaceful and like, yes, our family was in fact complete. My first thought was, ha, told you so, Allison. And then my mind went to, phew, I'm glad that's the answer because I wouldn't want to have that conversation with Thane. And then my mind continued on, and this is where I feel like the thoughts that came were not from me, because I've never separated pregnancy from raising a child before in my mind, but I thought, is it the pregnancy or the having another kid to raise that would be harder for Thane? Oh, definitely the having another child. He could probably handle another pregnancy. And then, completely out of nowhere, the thought, I should offer to be a surrogate for Allison, popped into my mind. I thought, whoa, where did that come from? I was shocked and surprised and thought that the idea was crazy and hilarious. I was just thinking, I'm so old, this is ridiculous. Nate Nelson would definitely just laugh at the idea and would not even want to consider it. Um, so I told Thane, who was sitting next to me, and he didn't seem to think it was nearly as funny as I did. <laughs> um, it was another few months before I finally fulfilled my commitment to let Allison know how it went when I prayed in the temple. Every once in a while I would think about it and rem remember that I had promised to return and report the results of that prayer, but then I'd realize it was going to be a longer conversation than just a quick text saying, yeah, my family's complete. So I kept putting it off and forgetting about it. Honestly, I kind of questioned myself sometimes, wondering if that really was as revelatory an experience as I thought it was. Did I just make it up? However, one day I was on an extended car ride with a couple that I'm very close with. On the ride, I shared with them the experience that I'd had in the temple, and as I was describing it to them, I realized that, like Nate and Allison, they had two kids, and like Allison, she had gotten very, very ill during her pregnancies. I almost felt like it would be rude of me not to offer to carry a baby for them, so I did kind of offer, um, and they quickly told me that they felt like their family was complete and that she had actually had her sister offer to carry a baby for them in the past, but that they had declined, so I felt better about that, but in this exchange, the biggest thing that stood out to me was this deep inner knowing that this was an offer for Allison and not for anyone else. It gave me confidence every time I tried questioning myself going forward. I just knew in my core that this was an offer for Allison and that lent legitimacy to my experience in the temple. Finally, one day shortly after that car ride, I told Thane that I needed to tell Allison about my experience in the temple. I said, if I'm going to tell her about what happened, we need to figure out if this is something we would actually be willing to offer. So Thane and I both prayed about it separately and afterwards I asked him how he felt. He replied, surprisingly peaceful. I felt the same. So we arranged for a time to do a FaceTime call with Nate and Allison. This was an unusual request. We don't typically do FaceTimes together. And so they were primed for some kind of an announcement. And when I started out the conversation by asking Allison if she remembered daring me to pray about whether we should have more kids or not in the temple, she immediately and excitedly said, oh, you're gonna have another baby. To which I responded, no, you're going to have another baby. Um, she and Nate were very confused, but their confusion turned to shock as I shared my experience with them. Now, remember, I went into this conversation expecting them to laugh at the idea. It was still so ridiculous and crazy to me. But instead of laughing, they cried, which of course made Thane and me cry as well. It really was such a sweet and tender experience. And they were so shocked, but so grateful and said that they would pray about it and get in touch. Um, unbeknownst to me, they had been really wanting more kids, but they were legitimately concerned that Allison wouldn't be able to keep her thyroid medications down if she got pregnant, and that would be awful for both her and any potential baby. At about the time of that girl's trip in California, Allison had been really baby hungry, or clucky as they call it in Australia, and they had considered adoption or even surrogacy, but for various reasons they didn't think those options would work for them, so they had pretty much resigned themselves to not having any more babies until this door opened. So they prayed and researched and felt good about moving forward. 
Allison told me that when they told her mom a couple of weeks after our FaceTime call, her mom's response was, so that's why Nate has been walking around with a huge grin on his face for the past two weeks. He was so excited about this prospect. Many people have asked how my kids took the news. Um, it was pretty funny to see their reactions. Mostly they were confused, but a couple of them were pretty weirded out by it, especially by the part where their cousin was frozen and flown across the ocean. Um, at one point after I was pregnant and had a big baby belly, my then three-year-old said something about his brother in my belly, and I told him it's not his brother, it's his cousin, to which he responded, my cousin brother, and we decided that was close enough. Um, so speaking of telling people, one of Thane's stipulations, actually his only stipulation in giving his support, was that he got full rights to make as many jokes about me carrying my brother's baby as he wanted to. Um, and he did have fun announcing to friends and family that Beth is pregnant, but it's not my baby, or Beth is pregnant, but we're not keeping this one. Those statements got some entertaining reactions. But his announcement on Facebook was the worst. <laughs> it was along those same lines, but much more drawn out. And he considers it his greatest literary work. But some people were less than happy about the emotional roller coaster that he took them on. He still gets scolded by people who saw the Facebook post. Um, I much preferred my social media announcement, which was a picture of Nate and Allison on either side of me making a heart with their hands over my belly. Um, we took that picture when we were together at Christmas when I was about four months along and just barely starting to feel the baby move. It was sweet to be together th at that point. Um, okay, back to the timeline. So throughout all of this, there was a lot of excitement and also a lot of uncertainty. There are so many places along the way in this journey that everything could be halted. The embryos needed to be made. My body had to be prepped for receiving the embryo. We had to have lawyers and all four of us had to have individual psychological evaluations. Then there was the transfer and the uncertainty of whether it would stick or not. And then after about nine weeks, they turned us over from the fertility clinic to my regular OBGYN and it was treated like a normal though high risk pregnancy. It was considered high risk because of my age, 41 by the time the transfer happened and the fact that it was an IVF pregnancy. Throughout the process, I realized how many ethical dilemmas could come up, and it made me so grateful that all four of us see eye to eye on most of those potentially sticky decisions. Um, a couple of things worth mentioning from the beginning stages of this process are the shots that I had to take and the way the extra hormones impacted my body. When sharing this, I want to be sensitive to the fact that there are many, many women out there who do both sides of the IVF process, harvesting the eggs as well as prepping the body for implantation, and I want them to know that I admire them so much and now have such a deeper respect for their journey. There's so much anticipation and uncertainty and discomfort and pain and exhaustion, and for so many, the results are not what they'd hoped for, and it is truly heartbreaking. I have a friend who did the IVF process eight times and has three children. I am in awe of her and her husband's dedication to bring their children earthside. So yes, this is a sensitive topic, and I fully recognize that there are many people whose experience is much harder than mine was, and I just want to honor and acknowledge them here at the beginning. Um, having said that, as anyone who has done IVF before knows, there's a whole lot of medication that needs to be taken to help prepare the body to receive an embryo. It has to be taken on a specific schedule and is taken into the body in a variety of ways. Um, one part of the process is taking a daily shot. Now again, I recognize that there are people, plenty of people in the world who take multiple shots on a daily basis and many people who are brave enough to do their own shots. I am very impressed with them, but for me, this was a first and it was not my favorite part of the process. I have to say too that this was the biggest problem I had with how my case was handled by the fertility clinic that we used. Overall, they did a fantastic job, but I feel like they really dropped the ball on this part of the process for me. They said they would have a nurse call me to explain how to administer my shots, and I never received that call. And I couldn't get a hold of someone at the clinic to explain it to me on the weekend that I was supposed to start the shots. So um, even though I work in the medical field, administering shots was never something I've done or had any experience with, and it terrified me. Thank heavens, my sister-in-law on Thane's side is a nurse and was kind enough to come to my rescue. She taught me how to do it and explained the best ways to do it and offered to do it for me as long as I needed her to. I am so grateful for her. Um, once I was trained, I mostly had Thane give me the shots, but occasionally if Thane wasn't available, I asked my 12-year-old daughter to do it for me. It was not her favorite thing either. She told me once, this hurts me more than it hurts you which made me laugh. Um, at one point, I went on a weekend trip to Dallas for a coaching conference and asked friends who I, I had only met over Zoom and had never met before in person if they would be willing to shoot me in the booty. And they were both willing, but I only made one of them do it. So thanks, Sonia, for the part you played in helping bring this baby into the world. And kudos to my mama also, since she was 
in Dallas that weekend as well randomly and also gave me a shot one of the days. So as I mentioned before, I have had six babies previous to this pregnancy and I don't know if it's because I was older or because I had so many extra hormones pumped into my body, but the first trimester was definitely the hardest one of all of my pregnancies. I never understood before how drinking water could make someone nauseous or how certain smells could be absolutely intolerable, but these are experiences to which I can now relate. Um, but while I was emotional and more nauseous and uncomfortable and tired than I'd been with my other pregnancies, I never threw up and was able to function pretty well overall. One really interesting thing that happened was that I started having cravings for things that Allison loves. She and I have very different palates. Um, hers is way more refined. She likes sour, tart, salty, vinegary things, and I just like anything that has sugar in it. Um, but during this first trimester, I would be grossed out at the thought of the sweets I typically love, like really grossed out, and wanted to choose food items that were much more in line with what Allison likes. For me, during that first bit of pregnancy, when the nausea is prevalent, I tend to have food constantly on my mind because I feel like I have to eat to keep myself from feeling too sick, but the thought of most foods would make me feel sicker and gag, and so I just spent a lot of time obsessing over food and being grossed out by it at the same time. Um, one day early in the pregnancy, I went to the grocery store in a desperate attempt to find something that sounded good to eat. I literally wandered around the store looking at things and gauging my gag reactions. I ended up buying hummus and sauerkraut and cherry pie. <laughs> All of those are things that Allison loves and would not be my normal go-tos. Even the pie thing. I'd normally choose like an apple pie or something that was more sugary or like more sweet. Um, but this time I was attracted to the more tart option. So I wanted to eat that cherry pie so desperately that the fact that I had to pick up my daughter from school and didn't have utensils in the car didn't stop me. <laughs> um, I dug in with my hands while I was sitting in the pickup line and sent a picture to Allison and she said that was the most pregnant thing she'd ever seen. Um, it was pretty funny. So the second trimester was quite heavenly. I felt great actually. I didn't have to pump extra hormones into my body and I felt well physically and emotionally. I knew to cherish that time before the third trimester when I would be getting huge and uncomfortable. And this is the trim trimester when I started feeling the baby move and that is always my favorite part of pregnancy. There were a couple of times when I noticed him going wild in my belly, once while I was watching The Princess Bride in a movie theater and once when I went to see a friend in Susicle the Musical. And Ames was moving around like crazy during the loud and exciting music and I figure he just has really good taste. So third trimester. as predicted. It was much less than comfortable. I got big and would occasionally underestimate my girth and hit my belly while opening the car door or not be able to squeeze through spaces that I thought I could manage. This comes with the territory. In one of my earlier pregnancies, I went into a small bathroom stall and realized that I couldn't shut the door because of my baby belly and laughed pretty hard at myself as I moved to the biggest stall available. Um, another typical issue for me late in pregnancy is that my back hurts while I'm driving. It's always in a specific spot on my left side, middle back. During this pregnancy, it was particularly bad. And when we did a 20 hour road trip to and from Texas to see the eclipse at eight months pregnant, I was in a lot of pain. I had to lie down frequently and I used a device called the Resimax pain tuner that helped me tolerate the drive. It was rough, but we made it and the trip was totally worth it. I also need to give a quick shout out to Thane and my kiddos who were absolute rock stars throughout this entire experience. There was a lot of sacrifice on Thane's part, and he picked up a lot of slack for me before, during, and after the pregnancy. I'll also throw out there, just for education purposes, that abstinence was required a couple of times during this process, one of which was due to the placenta previa that I had, which I will talk about more in depth later. Um, I'm so very grateful for Thane's love and support and steadiness. It made all the difference for me. And our kids, particularly the older ones, really stepped up their helpfulness game. They were so wonderful and kept each other alive when I had to lay down or was otherwise unable to fulfill my usual mom duties. The last bit of the pregnancy had some uncertainty and excitement as well. They discovered that I had placenta previa, where the placenta is partially in front of the cervix, and they thought that I might have to have a C-section at 37 weeks to make sure I didn't go into labor with the placenta in the way. The first time they noticed it, my OB made it sound like this is not uncommon and that frequently the placenta moves out of the way as the uterus expands. So we were all fully confident that it would not be an issue at all and it would have moved by the time that they did the follow-up ultrasound. 
However, at the next ultrasound, the placenta was still in the way, and our OB told us that in all her years of caring for pregnant mamas, she'd only seen the placenta move this late in the pregnancy one time. So this made us all pretty sure we would be having a C-section, which to be honest, I wasn't too mad about. Um, the idea of not going through labor and having the baby out of me sooner than later was kind of attractive. However, miraculously, the placenta did end up having moved sufficiently by the next ultrasound and I was able to carry this sweet baby to 39 weeks. In hindsight, I am very grateful that we didn't have to do a C-section. It all worked out just right. Um, so because my case was considered high risk, the doctor wasn't going to let me go past my due date and wanted me to schedule an induction within the week prior to the due date. Generally, I like trying to do things as naturally as possible when it comes to having babies. With the five pregnancies after my first one, I had gone medication-free using hypnobirthing techniques, and my last two babies were born in a tub of warm water at a birth center. So initially, I was not thrilled at the idea of having a scheduled induction, but by the end of the pregnancy, I was so ready to have that sweet baby on the other side of my belly that I was game to get that scheduled, and we were planning on doing the induction on his due date. I think it's worth noting here that Nate and Allison were totally supportive of however I wanted to handle things with the birth. They are both medically trained, Nate's an ophthalmologist and Allison is a PA, and I wondered initially if they would be uncomfortable with me doing an unmedicated birth center birth. <laughs> um, and I think initially they were a little bit hesitant about that idea, but then they did say that they would support me in however I wanted to do it, as long as there was a hospital nearby just in case. <laughs> um, but I ended up deciding that I wanted the convenience of going to the OB closest to my house to decrease the impact on my routines and family, and that doing a medicated hospital birth would give me the greatest chance of being able to relax and enjoy the time with family during the birthing process. So that's what we went with. Um, little Ames apparently missed the memo as to when we were planning to have him. Um, he pretended to come two weeks before his due date by putting me into false labor. Um, initially, the plan was that Allison would fly over from Hawaii a few days prior to Nate and the kids coming so that the kids could get more time at school since it was the end of the school year. Uh, however, after I was having contractions two to five minutes apart consistently for two hours, they decided not to risk missing the birth of their baby and they switched their tickets and jumped on a plane as fast as they could. We joked that if they had missed it, this baby could say, like Dr. Doofenshmirtz from Phineas and Ferb, that neither of his parents were there for his birth. Um, but by the time we discovered that it was false labor, they were already on their way and they were happy to be here just in case I went into labor again. So I guess baby Ames just wanted us to get to play together for the last 10 days of his gestation. It was truly a heavenly time. My parents happened to be in town as well, and my mom was able to extend her stay so she could be around for the birth. We played hard, and I got pampered and spoiled by Nate and Allison and by having so many extra adults around to help drive kids places and watch soccer games and help with all the things. Um, I also have a couple of aunts who insisted on bringing dinner over multiple times at the end there prior to the baby coming and the timing of their offerings was so perfect. It was an incredibly huge help to me there at the end of the pregnancy and I am so very grateful. Um, I had other friends and neighbors who were so kind and thoughtful and served me and my family in different and beautiful ways and I am truly grateful for their efforts and kindness. The day we ended up going to the hospital was a bit prior to the scheduled induction date. They had us on a waiting list and called at around 9 p.m. to let us know that they had an opening and we could come if we wanted to. Initially, I told them no because I was worried about getting kids to school the next morning, but we got that sorted out. And when I called back to see if they could still take me, they said yes. So we celebrated with the kids, took some pictures, and then headed excitedly over to the hospital where they started the induction process shortly after midnight. I got an epidural this go around, my first one since having my first child, and it was so nice to be able to relax and chat and joke around with Thane and Nate and Allison and to be able to sleep for a good chunk of the night. I did have a reaction to the epidural where my blood pressure dropped and I felt really lightheaded, like I was about to pass out and was really shaky. They were able to get that under control but pumped a whole lot of extra fluids in me, so I was really, really puffy and swollen by the end of it all. But I labored pretty comfortably for about 10 hours and they had me start pushing and he came out pretty quickly. Thane was up by my head holding my hand. Nate helped hold one of my legs up and Allison got to catch the baby. Um, they put him straight onto my belly to do the cleanup and a little bit of suctioning of his mouth and I held his tiny little hand 
And they waited until the cord stopped pulsing, and then Nate and Thane held the scissors together to cut the cord, which sounds super cheesy and funny, and I wish I could have seen it better, but I was just happy to stare at the newborn on my belly. Um, they took him over to the bassinet with the warming lamp to do the measurements, and Allison went with him, and Nate started to head over and then paused, came back, and gave me this huge long hug and just said thank you over and over again, and we both cried. Um, it was another really beautiful and tender moment. And then he went and got to admire his tiny new bundle. He and Allison were both so smitten, and I don't blame them at all. Little Ames is an absolutely beautiful baby. Eventually, they moved us to our rooms, which were separate but next to each other. I nursed Ames in the hospital and throughout that first week of his life when he was here in Utah. It was such a delight every time Nate or Allison came pushing the little hospital bassinet on wheels into my room so that I could snuggle and feed Ames. This only happened a few times, though, since we were only in the hospital one night after he was born. The kids, mine and Nate and Allison's, all got to come and see the baby in the hospital briefly the day he was born. They were all so cute and excited, and Owen and Isla were absolutely thrilled to meet their new brother. Um, things went well for both Ames and I, and we were able to be discharged the next afternoon. The week they spent here in Utah after Ames was born is a bit of a blur to me. I stayed in my room the vast majority of the time, as you do after having a baby, and they brought Ames to me regularly. Nate and Allison and their kids stayed with our aunt and uncle who live about 10 minutes from my house. So during the nights I pumped and they were able to take that milk to help with the following night or other bottles that Ames would need. They supplemented with formula as well, so he was getting plenty of nourishment. It was a few days prior to their departure that the fact that they would be leaving soon started to hit me and my emotions started getting raw. But for the most part, I felt okay, massive, but okay. Um, it took a while for the swelling from the fluids they pumped into me during his birth to finally go down. Nate and Allison were very sweet and good about letting me have as much time with Ames as I wanted, and I really appreciated that. We even took a field trip to the zoo before they left. I sat in a wheelchair most of the time, and Nate pushed me around. Uh, my daughter pushed me around too, but she was scary, so Nate took over. <laughs> um, but it was fun to spend time together and see baby Ames out on an adventure with the family already. At 7 a.m. on the Friday after he was born, when he was exactly a week old, they took their sweet new bundle and headed home to Hawaii. I was a bit of a mess the day before they left, and then that day, I'm pretty sure I held it together when they came to say goodbye on the way to the airport, but not so much afterwards. Later that day, I felt this absolute need to go to the bird refuge that's by my house. I needed to be alone in nature and commune with God and let my emotions flow. I can't even call it a strong desire. It really did feel like an absolute need. However, I didn't have access to any of our vehicles for a variety of reasons. I'm sure I could have asked a friend to drive me over there, but I didn't want to bother anyone. And for half a second, I considered trying to ride a bike over there, but decided that walking was going to be my best bet. It generally takes about 20 minutes to walk to the bird refuge when I haven't given birth a week prior. So even as I started out on my walk, I knew I was being a bit foolish. But like I said, this was a need. It was non-negotiable <laughs> that I get to the bird refuge and I felt like I couldn't wait. So I began my walk and before I got even halfway down the block, I desperately felt like I had to sit or lay down and knew that I would never make it there walking. I was about to turn around when my sweet neighbor, who is always sensitive to God's promptings, happened to drive by. She stopped when she saw me and asked where I was going. When I told her, she looked at me like I was crazy. I was, and she offered to drive me over there. It was such a tender mercy for me, evidence that God was aware of me and the desperate needs of my heart. So my friend took me to the bird refuge on her way to wherever she was going and was hesitant to leave me there alone, but I promised her that Thane was going to be coming back soon and could pick me up. Um, she reluctantly dropped me off and I walked down one of the trails to a bench that's not very far from the road. It was as far as I could have made it though, and I sat there facing a little spot of water and just cried and cried. These tears were mostly tears of gratitude as I was processing this experience that I had just had. I was completely overwhelmed by the whole thing. The opportunity to have carried that perfect baby and how smoothly everything went, the beautiful experiences shared with my brother and sister-in-law and our families, the outpouring of kindness and love and support from family and friends and strangers who heard what I was doing in person and on social media, and the goodness of God throughout all of it. I was overwhelmed and grateful beyond comprehension or expression, and I also wasn't sure how my heart would handle being separated from that baby. I wasn't at the bird refuge very long before Thane came and picked me up. I don't remember much about the rest of that day, but I do remember the following day. 
that Saturday, the first day, full day of being separated from Ames was honestly one of the hardest days of my life. I should mention here that I caught a really bad cold a few days, sorry, a few weeks prior to Ames' birth. I had already been sleeping on the couch out in the living room for weeks of my own choosing because I was snoring so badly that it was making it impossible for Thane to sleep and I slept better propped up in the corner of the couch anyway. After I got the cold, it was pretty much impossible for me to sleep without being propped up and the cold lasted through having Ames and for a while afterwards. I eventually got better for most of the cold symptoms except the cough, which lingered, and then a few weeks later I caught another cold and that cough turned into pneumonia and I couldn't lay flat for weeks. All up, it was probably two or three months that I slept on the couch. It was pretty miserable. Uh, but that Saturday after they left, I spent the entire day in bed, sick and in pain emotionally and physically, and just so, so sad. My body was feeling the effects of my attempted walk to the bird refuge from the day before, so I was extra sore and bleeding a lot. And at one point, I said to Thane through tears that I was leaking out of pretty much every orifice of my body. <laughs> um, it felt like a new low. I'll say, too, that the tears that day and the ones on many seemingly random days following it were not overwhelmed with gratitude tears like that day at the bird refuge. These were just overwhelmed and sad tears. That Saturday was the hardest day, but as I mentioned, there were lots of other days that were really sad and emotional for me. They seemed to come kind of randomly. They didn't appear to have a specific trigger, and I didn't know when to expect them. Looking back, it seemed like I averaged to be about one and a half days every week for about seven weeks that ended up being those sad days where I would cry a lot. Um, and after that, they still happened, but they were fewer and further between. On these sad days, as I started calling them, I was usually able to keep functioning, but I would be crying while doing my daily things, especially when I was on car rides by myself. And I wanted to pull in and away from others, which is not like me. I think what I was experiencing was grief. It would hit seemingly randomly, last most of the day, fluctuating in intensity, and then the next day I would be fine. I'm sure that postpartum hormones were playing into this as well, but I've been hesitant to call it postpartum depression because it didn't feel like what I would have expected that to feel like. I never had it with any of my other pregnancies, but I, I didn't feel hopeless or in a dark pit of despair or anything, just sad. <laughs> but not even really sad about anything in particular, it seemed. I mean, sometimes thinking about Ames or something else would make me cry harder, but in my mind, I didn't think or feel like I was missing him terribly or pining away after him. Sometimes my mind would go to negative thoughts and I'd be down on myself, but that wasn't necessarily how it played out every time either. It was just such a bizarre and baffling experience for me because intellectually it didn't make sense to me while I was feeling such strong emotions. I realize that, that might sound silly. I think a lot of people would say that it makes perfect sense why I would be feeling that way, but hear me out. When we did our psych evaluations at the beginning of this whole process, Thane asked the psychologist the question that everyone asked me, would I be able to give away a baby that I had carried for nine months? My answer to that had always been an unhesitating and absolute yes. I honestly was not concerned at all that this would be difficult. I knew going into it that this wasn't my baby and I was so happy to be able to help my brother and his wife welcome a new child into their family. He's gonna be my nephew forever, so he will be in my life and it's not like I would never see him again. So I really didn't think it would be a problem at all. The psychologist kind of confirmed that belief for me when she said that typically the actual giving the baby away is not the hard part for the surrogate because that's a moment that they've pictured and looked forward to for a long time and it's usually a really joyous experience. The psychologist told us that more often how it plays out is that the hard part for the surrogate is the shift in relationship with the intended parents after the baby is born. The parents and surrogate usually have developed a close relationship over the time that they've gone through this process together. And then after the parents have their baby, they're busy with a newborn and exhausted and their relationship with the surrogate changes. And the loss of that closeness is usually the hardest part for the surrogate, according to the psychologist. I thought that was really interesting and not what I would have expected, but even hearing that, I figured it wouldn't apply to me since the intended parents are my siblings and I know that that relationship isn't going away. I sincerely believe that there would be absolutely no problem, zero problem for me in giving up the baby or in the relationship with Nate and Allison. Turns out I was wrong about that. <laughs> Again, intellectually, I didn't have a problem with giving up that sweet baby to his parents, but apparently biology is really strong and there was no reasoning with my body who thought she was supposed to have a baby. Now, I realize that of all the reasons to have a baby and then not have a baby afterwards, this is far and away the happiest. As a side note, this experience has given me so much 
deeper empathy and compassion for people who go through the loss of a baby for the variety of reasons that that could happen, usually with an added measure of trauma, which I didn't experience here. But even without that trauma and with the ideal circumstances under which the loss of a baby happened for me, it was still a loss and it was dang hard. The emotions would come on in waves and it drove me crazy that I couldn't put my finger on why I was crying or sad. I couldn't verbalize a reason. I told a friend that the logical, rational part of me knew that this was wonderful and good and was happy about it all, but the emotional, physical body, hormone part was struggling. My body thought that it was supposed to have a baby and I was feeling the loss or lack of that baby. I had this super strong desire to just pull in and away from everyone and everything. I visualized it as wanting to curl up in the fetal position and lay on my bed, which I did do a couple of times. I didn't want to do anything. Prior to having Ames, I had been chomping at the bit to work on growing my business. I wanted to learn how to do Google ads and Facebook ads and work on marketing, but I kept feeling like I just needed to focus on growing a baby and then I would figure things out from there. So I was really looking forward to having the baby in the spring and then during the summer when the big kids were home to watch my littles, I would jump into the business stuff with both feet. However, after the baby came, I didn't want to do anything, including anything with the business. I just wanted to be with my family. That was it. Usually, when I'm feeling good, I enjoy making eye contact and smiling at people around me when I'm out and about. However, I remember going to places during this time period and trying to avoid having eye contact with people because I didn't want to be seen and I didn't want to have to interact. And when I was with people I knew, I was afraid of having them ask how I was doing because I knew it would make me cry. I found myself really having to put into practice the tools I teach my clients as a coach to allow emotions, to breathe, to be okay with not being okay sometimes, to manage my brain when it wants to believe that this will last forever and I'll never feel better. It was so freaking hard and has given me so much deeper insight into grief and sadness and emotional dysregulation. I remember reaching out to a friend who gave some wise advice. (laughs) She said, feelings are like a children's book of ours that says of an obstacle, can't go over it, can't go under it, can't go around it, got to go through it. Um, I think this was a good and concise way to think of it. Another surprising change was that I didn't feel like I had the capacity or any desire whatsoever to learn anything. Usually I'm switching between multiple podcasts and an audiobook or rocking out to my playlist when I'm driving places, but after having aims, I couldn't listen to podcasts or books or even music with words. During my drives alone, I either sat in silence or played soft music without lyrics. I desperately craved stillness. Speaking of desperate cravings, this may seem strange, but I felt a need like I'd never felt before to be with God. I wanted to be in nature, at the bird refuge, which I started calling the Bethany refuge, or in the temple where I often feel closer to God. I needed to be still and in quietness and just be with God. I felt like perhaps I needed to connect more with my Heavenly Mother, and while I'm sure that happened, it hasn't been in a way that I can really recognize intellectually or consciously, but I do think that on a deeper level, my heart and soul have been carved deeper, and perhaps that will help me recognize her more. Another one of the interesting things that happened after Ames was born is that I really felt a strong urge slash desire slash need to get my house in order physically. It felt like nesting. I just wanted my home to look nice and be organized, and the clutter that you can imagine happens with six young kids at home got to me more than it typically does. Unfortunately, I can't report that I made any drastic changes to the organizational status of my house or household, but the desire was there and was strong for a while. Um, I've done a lot of contemplating on how and why I responded the way that I did. Again, in my head, none of this is going to be a problem, but my heart apparently missed that memo. And while the psychologist's commentary was wrong to some degree, I will say that if she was talking about just the moment of giving away the baby, she was right. That was indeed a tender and sweet moment that had been planned for and imagined and looked forward to, and it wasn't hard at all. But I don't think that that moment was all that Thane was thinking about when he asked her if I'd have a hard time giving away this baby. And if she meant that everything following that moment would not be hard, she was dead wrong. She was right, though, about the change in relationship with the intended intended parents being challenging. I was surprised at how desperately I felt like I needed to hear from Nate and Allison after they left. They had long flights, and there's a four-hour time difference, and they had some crazy stuff happen right after they got home to Hawaii. So they weren't super communicative for the first day or so after they left, and that was surprisingly hard for me. 
I craved pictures and updates and just hearing how they were all doing. I texted them and told them that I felt like the annoying ex-girlfriend who just couldn't let it go and that I would try not to bug them all the time. And I really had to tell myself to give them some space and not text them every five minutes. That only lasted for a couple of days, but I remember thinking the psychologist was right about how hard that change would be. And I will say though, that Nate and Allison have both been so sweet and attentive and good to me. After things settled a bit on their end, they sent me lots of pictures and videos, and even now they check in with me regularly to see how I'm doing. Nate will call sometimes on his drive into work and we'll chat, and he always asks me how I'm doing. And Allison sends pictures and videos of sweet baby Ames, and those do my heart so much good. They love him so very much and his siblings absolutely adore him and it makes my heart so happy to see how incredibly loved he is. Um, people have asked me about the nursing experience with Ames. I knew I wanted to nurse a bit at the beginning so that he could get that colostrum to set him up for having a healthy immune system, but I wasn't sure exactly how I would handle things after that. People had suggested that I could sell the breast milk, but I didn't want to commit to any kind of quota and I didn't want to do the research to figure out how to go about doing that. So I figured I would just pump and dump for a little bit while also taking Sudafed or some other kind of cold medicine to dry up the milk. My OB told me that if medicine will dry up leaky noses, it'll dry up leaky boobs. <laughs> so that was my general plan, though I did feel bad about just throwing away good breast milk. Here's another tender mercy and evidence to me of the divine orchestration of all of this. A few days prior to Nate and Allison leaving, a friend two doors down from me texted to see how I was doing, and she asked about what my plans were as far as drying up my milk supply. It turns out the baby she and her husband had adopted six months prior was having trouble with his formula, and it had been recommended to them that they find a breast milk donor to see if that would help with his tummy. So that worked out perfectly. I was able to pump and give the milk to my friend, and my supply gradually diminished over three or four weeks, and I never had to use the cold medicine. Um, this happens to be the same friend who drove me to the bird refuge that day that Nate and Allison left. She told me that the breast milk really seemed to help her son. He'd been having explosive vomit after every bottle of formula, but that stopped when they started at supplementing with my breast milk. I'm so grateful, and again, am in awe at seeing the hand of God and his goodness in all of this. And that sweet little neighbor baby ended up being helpful for me too. A couple months after I had Ames, I realized that I really needed to hold a baby. Another amazingly kind neighbor of mine had been so thoughtful and bought me one of those really expensive, lifelike baby dolls. She customized him to try to look like the pictures I had posted of Ames and gave him to me, figuring that my arms would need to have something to hold. I did snuggle that baby doll sometimes and was so touched at her thoughtfulness and the kindness of this gesture. Um, but there did come a time when I wanted to hold a real baby, and even though holding Ames wasn't an option, I wasn't sure that I wanted to hold him anyway. The thought of holding him made me cry hard, and I didn't think that I would be able to handle that. But I did want to hold a baby, so I texted my neighbor whose little guy had used my breast milk, and she didn't hesitate to say yes, and it was really good for my heart to cuddle him. Um, as I've looked back and pondered on my reaction to all of this and why it was so strong, I've come to the conclusion that, ironically, the very things that I thought would make this experience easier are probably the exact things that made it so hard. I have spoken with other surrogates whose experience was more of a business arrangement, whether they went through an agency or did it for a friend who paid them, and they didn't seem to have a hard time emotionally like I did. And I wonder if perhaps the fact that ours wasn't a business arrangement and didn't have a clear cutoff after the baby was born is what made it so hard for me. I thought that knowing that Ames would be my family forever and that my relationship with Nate and Allison would continue on would make the separation much easier, but I now wonder if that is precisely what made the feelings and emotions so much more tender when there was that separation. I spoke with another woman who carried a baby for her sister, and she definitely related to the emotional challenges that I was experiencing. Her sister lived close by though, so she was able to go and hug that baby regularly, and I wonder if Ames wasn't taken so far away so soon after his birth, if that would have made the grieving process any easier. Who knows? It's not how it played out, and this is now my story. So, as I mentioned, as of this writing, I am just over five months postpartum, closer to six months now, and it's hard to remember the exact timeline of things, but in general, I would say that the really hard emotional time lasted about seven or eight weeks, and then I've had a number of emotional days since then, but they've been more sporadic with more time between them than at the beginning. And I think that as my hormones are starting to stabilize more, I have felt 
much more like myself again. <laughs> in just the past few weeks, I've noticed that I have more physical and emotional energy and stamina. I can do stairs without wanting to cry. <laughs> um, and it's getting easier to get excited about things again. And I have the desire to host people at my house again. My voracious appetite for learning is mostly back and I'm taking an online course and listening to multiple podcasts again. And my desire to do things in general and work on growing my concussion-related coaching and occupational therapy practice has come back in full force with occasional retreats into just wanting to be with my family. Um, and the nesting instinct is dissipating too, <laughs> which is kind of sad. There's a part of me that really wants that to stay strong um, so that I can actually get my house in order, but alas. Um, also, I am carrying still an extra, who knows how many pounds of souvenir baby weight, which has been part of the emotional challenge and is taking longer than I would like for it to go away, but I am making progress and feeling stronger and that is helping. Oh man, I have to tell you though, I was so weak after this pregnancy and maybe it's because it was the seventh time my body has done this or maybe it's because I'm older this go around. I don't know the cause and I don't know that it matters, but I remember a little over a month after having Ames, we went camping in Yellowstone and on the drive up there, we stopped for a picnic lunch. I was squatting down next to one of the food containers facing uphill on a very, very slight incline and I lost my balance and started falling backwards. And I had just about zero abdominal strength and just fell backwards all the way. It was like slow motion and I wasn't hurt at all other than my pride. Um, but it was very humbling to realize how little strength I had. Um, I have been doing Pilates and I feel like that has been actually a really effective and gentle strengthening exercise. My favorite YouTube Pilates videos come from Move with Nicole. She kicks my booty every time. Um, and also walks out in nature with occasional spurts of running have been good for my body and soul as well. I think it's worth mentioning that when Nate and Allison took Ames home a week after he was born, we were all kind of wondering why they didn't stay longer. Um, there were a few things that they wanted to get back to Hawaii for, but nothing so urgent that they absolutely had to leave. Um, but they just kind of felt like they should head home. So they went ahead and left that Friday. It turns out it was a major blessing that they left when they did because the day after they got back to Hawaii, Ames had several seizures. Because Nate works at a hospital, he was able to connect with his friend who's a pediatric neurologist who was about to leave for a military assignment for three months but was able to get Ames in for testing. So they had tests done on Saturday and Sunday and by Monday they had a diagnosis which was insanely fast and such an incredible blessing. Ames has a rare genetic condition called benign familial neonatal epilepsy which one of my brothers and my mom both had as well. Um, he was started on anti-seizure medication and has been seizure-free since, and it's anticipated that he'll grow out of having them by about six months of age. I want to mention too that I did go out to Hawaii to snuggle that baby. It was at the end of August, beginning of September. This was when Ames was just under four months old. I think that it was the perfect timing for me. If I had gone sooner, it probably would have been too hard emotionally, but if I had gone much later than that, I would have really regretted not getting to see or snuggle him when he was still a little baby. In fact, we realized the day that I got there that it was the year anniversary of the day they transferred his embryo into me. That seemed like a crazy coincidence. A few days before I left for this trip, I had been having a really rough day emotionally. I was irrationally angry and irritated by small things that normally wouldn't bug me, and my mind was in a really negative place all morning. Um, it was really bugging me, and I finally went and knelt down by my bed and started praying. And it was really interesting because as I was praying, all that was coming up for me was Ames and how hard it might be to be with him. I had no idea that subconsciously I was anxious about being with him, but apparently I was, and it was coming out in the form of irritability with negative thought patterns. After realizing that, I cried and talked to Thane and processed a bit and felt better by the end of the day and didn't have that negativity come back. Then when I did get to see that sweet baby, it was nothing but good. Nate picked me up from the airport, and as I waited for him to get me, I watched the Instagram reel that I had made after they left to take, to take Ames home and was surprised and pleased that it didn't bring up tears. Um, I sat in the back of the car by Ames's car seat on the drive to their house, and he gave me the biggest, sweetest smile when he saw me. Um, he stared into my eyes, and I swear he was reading my soul and apparently he does that to everyone. <laughs> um, he's just an absolute delight. Yes, I am biased, but truly he is an angelic little being. He's so calm and sweet and delightful. It was really wonderful spending a few days with him and Nate and Allison and their older kiddos and Allison's parents who also live out there. Um, I really love that family and it was so much fun to see how much Ames's older siblings absolutely adore him. He is one incredibly loved baby and it makes my heart so happy to see it. Um, I did cry a tiny bit 
the day that I left. Um, but I was really pleased that it was not more than a tiny bit and it actually hasn't been a problem since. So overall, just a really, really wonderful trip and I'm so grateful I got to see him in his natural environment. Um, people have been so kind and sweet when they hear that I've done this surrogacy thing and they often say really nice things about me for doing this. Um, but I just honestly, truly feel like I can't take credit for any of it. <laughs> um, I know it wasn't my idea, clearly was not my idea. And I also know that my body's ability to carry babies so well is a gift from above. There's nothing that I did to deserve that. It's just a blessing. Um, often when I say this to someone, they'll respond with, well, you agreed to do it. <laughs> and yes, I did agree to do it, but that's because I have found that following God's path for me is 100% the happiest, most peaceful, and most thrilling way to live. He has taken me on some incredible adventures, and I truly stand all amazed at the experiences that I've been able to witness and be a part of fully recognizing, again, that my participation was a privilege and a blessing from above. You know how sometimes as part of people's New Year's goal setting, they choose a word to focus on throughout the year? Well, in 2022, the word that I had chosen was consecrate. Um, I sincerely wanted to give my heart, soul, mind, body, and will to God. I'd frequently prayed, here's all of me, make of me what you will. I wondered, and honestly sometimes kind of hoped, when this whole experience was starting to unfold, if it was more of an Abrahamic test, like the kind that God just needs to see you're willing to do but doesn't actually have you go through with. <laughs> um, I would have been totally fine if Nate and Allison had decided not to do this, but I am grateful that I was able to prove to myself and to God that I was in fact willing. And God saw me through every step of the way. One of the most inspired and comforting messages I got during the challenging emotional time following the birth was from someone from the Netherlands that I met through my work. I want to read you part of the text that she sent me totally out of the blue. Um, she said, Dear Bethany, you get prayers from our parish in Holland. We are so proud of you and what you did for your brother and his wife. Do you know that Maria was the first surrogate mother, the first woman who said, yes, I will carry this child for you. So I think you are in good company. I hope you allow yourself to grieve. The greatest expressions of love are accompanied by intense pain. It was like she could see into my soul at that moment. I will be forever grateful for her kindness and encouragement and following what I'm sure was a prompting from God to reach out to me. Again, I feel so grateful to have been able to offer this and to have shared this experience with my family. And I'm so grateful to God for guiding me into and through the whole thing. I give all glory to him and hope and pray that the lessons that I've learned from all of this will stay with me. I feel like I've been changed by this experience. And while I'm so grateful to start feeling like myself again, and I'm thrilled to appreciate the fact that I can pick up my four and six year olds and that walking up and down stairs doesn't strike fear into my heart or exhaustion into my body and that I can drive without any pain in my back. Um, I hope that the carving deeper of my soul will allow me to have more empathy and be able to love and support others on a deeper level going forward. And that precious little boy that I get regular pictures and videos of was 1 billion percent worth it. Um, thank you for listening if you've made it all the way to the end here. Like I said, I'm not totally sure why I felt like I needed to put this out there, but I did. And I hope it's helpful for someone. If anyone out there is listening to this and considering doing a surrogacy, I would highly recommend having included as part of the deal that the surrogate has prearranged meetings with a therapist or life coach or someone who can help navigate the potential emotional challenges. I actually had multiple friends, some of whom are life coaches, and an aunt who is a psychiatric nurse reach out and offer to talk with me if I ever needed it, which I appreciated so much. But I did not do a lot of reaching out when I was in the depths of the emotional pain. I think if something had been prearranged and it was just expected that I would go talk to someone on certain dates and certain times, um, that would have been more helpful. And honestly, while I'm throwing great ideas out there, I think that it should be something that's included for all brand new moms everywhere. <laughs> Whether it's a surrogacy or not, there's so much crazy that happens after babies are born and that doesn't get talked about. There can be so much trauma around birth, even when everything turns out okay in the end. I realized the other day that every single one of my sisters-in-law on both sides of the family have had extreme challenges with their birth experiences every one of them. And I've got a lot of siblings <laughs> and my husband has three siblings. So this was very humbling to realize. I don't know why I got so lucky to have good pregnancies and births, but it also just made me realize how much support is needed. So I'm going to go ahead and get off my soapbox now.
Thank you for listening. I hope something in this was helpful for you to hear. If you have any questions about my surrogacy experience, please feel free to reach out to me. I am more than happy to chat about it and I'm clearly an open book. Um, my email address is bethany at theconcussioncoach.com. And if you have any interest in learning about concussion recovery, check out my other podcast episodes. If not, no worries. Thank you for being here. And to all of you, God bless.